Dear participants, you are all welcome to our webinar. We have already known our guest. It is a great honor for us to be together with him today. He is known for Sierra's project, shifting baselines, fishing down marine food webs, fish base, eco pet with ecosim, and so on. He is a marine biologist, fishery scientist, and professor at the University of British Columbia in Canada. Ladies and gentlemen, Prof. Dr. Daniel Pauri is with us today. He completed his high school and university studies in Germany, his doctorate in 1979 and the habilitation 1985 are in fisheries biology from the University of Kiel, which is uh, among the 200 top universities. Uh, I had a chance to be there a few years ago. After many years at the International Center for Living Aquatic Resource Management in Manila, Philippines, Daniel Pardi became, in 1994, professor at the Fisheries Center of the University of British Columbia, Vancouver, Canada. Uh, at that time, I was, uh, I just started to work on fisheries. I was, I was at the beginning, so he became professor. Daniel Pardi has supervised a large number of master and PhD students in four languages on five continents, almost all over the world, particularly in Philippines, Germany, Canada, to concept methods and software which Daniel Pardi developed, documented in over 1,000 scientific and general interest publications are used throughout the world. So his work is recognized in various profiles, notably Science, Nature, New York Times, and by numerous awards, among them honorary doctorates from four universities, being elected a fellow of the Royal Society of Canada, Academy of Science in 2003, and receiving many awards, such as Award of Excellence of American Fisheries Society, International Cosmos Prize from Japan, Volvo Environmental Prize from Sweden, Excellence in Ecology Prize from Germany, Ramon Margalef Prize in Ecology from Spain, Albert Lair Grand Medal in Science category, uh, and so on. Daniel was also knighted as Chevalier de la Légion d'Honneur in 2000. Uh, 70 by the French government. Now the floor is yours, Daniel. Feel free for Thank the you. time limitation because we can listen you the whole day, but please save some well, time also for the questions and answer. Thank you. Floor is yours. Nice. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I'm glad to be in your country, if only virtually. I will present uh, now the, the uh, um, sharing my screen and here we are and <clears throat> i will be speaking about uh, oxygen and the growth of fish and uh, this is something that has started <clears throat> after my work after after i did a master uh, in germany i went to work for two years in indonesia and in Indonesia, I, I saw lots of fish. This is, this is a center of marine biodiversity. And we didn't have information on them and uh, no way that we were going to get information on them. And yet uh, we, need, we need to have the, we need to know the growth, the mortality and everything about this fish. So I thought we, we, need, we need a theory that tells us how they grow. We cannot study them one by one. And um, I, I decided I was going to develop a theory. And I did, and um, I presented it in 79 in my dissertation, and uh, nobody cared. Nobody, that was not, not interesting to anybody. But I continued to work on it, but it was not my main work. And uh, after now that uh, we have global warming, people are beginning to listen to it. 
uh, people are getting interested. And so now as I speak and work more about this theory than about fisheries. And uh, we now will start with this theory. Now, basically, <clears throat> we have to imagine living in the water as a very difficult thing because breathing is for us very easy. But for fish, it's a, it's a hard job. One liter of air contains 30 times more oxygen than a liter of water. And because the water is more heavy and more viscose, it's much more difficult to move it. And so when you have to move air uh, into your lung and out, it's very easy. But if you have to move water across your gills, it's lots of work. And molecules move much, much faster in air, 300,000 times faster in air than in water. Now, because gills are so important and oxygen to fish uh, and to us also, try not to breathe for two minutes and you will be, you'll, you'll, you, will, you will collapse, right? So what it means is that the first fish that emerged, if, if this little thing on top is, is to be viewed as a fish, uh, they had very small gill, the reconstruction uh, and uh, the, of their head shows that the, the gills must have been very inefficient. And so this, they remained small and they were probably very, very quiet, very sluggish. Now, if you look at the modern fish like a carp or a shark, the head is full of gill. This is, this is important. If you fill your head with gills, uh, they must be important, except except for the fish in the corner, uh, in the right, uh, in the left corner. It has a very small head. It get big. How can that be? Well, it it actually doesn't breathe uh, water. It breathes air. And this fish, Rarapaima, they live in Brazil and in Peru in the in the rivers. They <clears throat> They, they drown, they die if they cannot come to the surface to breathe air. So gills are difficult. Now, this is not a fish. Look again, this is not a fish. But it has a feature that is very important for this presentation. In the front, you see the radiator, right? And what is a radiator for? It's to cool the engine. Now, how do you cool an engine? It, uh, the engine heats up and you and it has water that circulates inside and this hot water is brought by pump into the radiator and the hot water goes through lamellae the radiator has lots of little lamellae and and the lamellae they are exposed to air and the air that the car moves into goes across the lamellae and picks up the heat. So the, 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 the heat of the engine goes from the water into the air and the air gets the heat. So now imagine you want to have a bigger engine, you want to go fast because you, you want to be rob the bank and you have to run faster than the police. In France, lots of Detective stories and, and, and gangster stories are uh, with this car. The, this is a, a famous car in France, this car. Anyway, so, so you have to make a bigger engine. Why do you be, a bigger engine needs a bigger radiator, right? And how do you make the radiator bigger? You can make it higher, right? The car is high. The, the, you can make it wider, but not too wide because then you have problems on the street. The, there would be the other car coming from the other side. How about making it deeper? Well, you cannot. You cannot make it deeper because if you make it deeper, the, the air that comes out in the back is too hot. And there's no, there's no reason to put another radiator because it cannot do its job if it is after the first radiator, second radiator. So 
the, the radiator can grow only in height, in width, but not in depth. Now, now, how do gills work? Exactly the same way. You have a flow of water going across lamellae, uh, which are which are perfused with blood, or arterial blood, and so is venous blood, and and basically the 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 the, the oxygen in the water gets picked up by uh, the hemoglobin in the blood and goes into the blood and the water that comes in the back of the gill of the lamellae is almost free of oxygen. So it, there is no point putting other gills behind the gills. So even though the gills look, look like they are three-dimensional, they are actually two-dimensional. They, they, they really are a surface which has a height, which has a, a width, but cannot grow in depth. So what does it mean? It means that when a fish grow and it becomes heavier, the gill, gills also grow, but they don't grow as fast as the body because the body grows with a cube of the length. The cube, the length and the length and the length, but the, the gills grow with the length times the length. And not time again time because because it grows in two dimensions, not not three. Actually, it grows in two and a half dimension, so almost two and a half. And the relationship between the growth of the weight and the growth of the of the surface area of the gills is about 0.8. It's not one. One would mean that the gills grow as fast as the volume or the weight. And 0.66 would mean would mean it grows as a, really as a surface. It's a, actually intermediate. 0.8 for most fish, it's 0 0.75, 0 0.8 about. As you can see here, uh, showing uh, the red arrow. So when a fish get big, as it gets bigger, the surface area per volume or per weight declines, goes down. Now, what does it mean? It means in A, if you look at the left side, that a fish that gets big, because of its gills, uh, not being able to grow as fast as the volume, the gill area per volume or per weight declines as the weight increase. So, because the oxygen you get as a fish depends on the surface area of your gills, this is also the oxygen supply that declines. <clears throat> so per unit weight, a big fish gets less oxygen than a small fish. Now, <clears throat> there must be a weight <clears throat> at some point, which is just enough for, which gives the fish just enough oxygen for it to live, but not to grow. Before that weight, the fish can grow because there is, a, there is a scope for growth. Let's call it K1, a scope for growth that is positive. At some point, this the growth, the scope for growth becomes zero. And at that point, the fish cannot grow anymore, right? And the metabolic rate, the oxygen consumption at that level we can call it maintenance metabolism, okay? Maintenance, because it just maintains the fish. Now, fish and other animals that breathe water, like uh, like uh, lobsters and and jellyfish and, and everything that is in the water, like live, that lives water, breathe water, they don't maintain their own temperature like us, 37 degree all the time, whether it's we live in a desert or in a, in uh, in uh, in Antarctica, we 37 uh, temperature, and if we if we deviate from that, we die. Well, fish don't; they can uh, adapt to different temperatures. About 10 degree, a range of 10 degrees, they can they can they can tolerate uh, most of them. But 
if if a, if you increase the temperature on a fish, uh, if you increase the temperature of the water, the body is warmer, and they have to in, to use more oxygen. And we'll talk about why, but they they have to consume more oxygen. So the oxygen <clears throat> demand is increasing, and therefore the point at which they cannot grow anymore is reached at a smaller size. And so the fish stay smaller when it's warm. That's the first thing that you can you can follow logically by the fact that the gills cannot grow as fast as the volume. <clears throat> and this is well known. This is known for a long time and it can be illustrated here uh, in the uh, in uh, in in C, uh, simply by looking at a cod in Iceland where it's very cold, and a cod in uh, in France where it's not so cold, you can have in France the cod would grow fast at first because it's warm, but stay smaller. In Iceland it grows slowly at first, but it continues to grow for a long time. <clears throat> now, most researchers that do uh, studies of growth and metabolism and so on in the lab, they work only with fish that are small because you don't have a space in your laboratory for a cod of one meter length. So they, this is confusing because the higher temperature at first, they grow faster and they grow bigger at the small temperature. For example, until uh, relative age of five, well, the, the French cod are bigger than the Icelandic cod. But this, this uh, relationship is turned around, is reversed at age 20. And that has caused lots of confusion. Now, we use this principle in, in a paper that, was, uh, that, did, <laughs> that had lots of success um, to predict that in the future, <clears throat> in the future, fish would get uh, smaller simply because it's warmer. And a bunch of colleagues, physiologists from Norway, started criticizing that paper that is based on, on false, uh, uh, false uh, logic that because the gill are not limiting. And uh, it was necessary then to write a series of papers where this was uh, where re-established the gills are limiting. And <clears throat> now those of you that are a little bit tired from last night uh, can fall asleep because in the next 10 minutes, I will explain this model and it's, uh, it's a bit boring, but let's start in the middle. Uh, we start here. What is growth? Well, growth is, is uh, is the change of size per unit time. Uh, it can be positive. Uh, when the change is positive, for example, 10 grams per day or something like that. And it can be negative. You can lose weight. Here we, uh, in terms of growth of fish, we have uh, this growth, DWDT, is, is really, uh, a difference between a process that increase the, the size and process that decrease the size. This is uh, well admitted uh, uh, in, a, in a, since the, the 1920s that, that they are process uh, of synthesis, of anabolism, and process of um, decrease uh, called catabolism but they are badly defined. So the, the synthesis of body substance is a function of something, let's call it H, and it's a function of weight. Obviously, if you are big, you, you, you grow much more than if, if you are small in, in weight, but it's also a function of a parameter which I call D, very easy, you will remember, this is D like Daniel, uh, and this parameter D is the power that I mentioned before 
that is smaller than one that gills, uh, that grow of the growth of gill, that it, it is not as fast as the weight itself. So it is about 0.8 or 0.6 or 0.7. Uh, it's lower than one. And, and because essentially in order to grow, you, in order to, to synthesize body substance, you must get oxygen. And this oxygen, and, uh, oops, sorry. And I, I mentioned that it is uh, less than one. And in most fish, it is about 0 0.8, 0 0.7. Uh, here you can see this power uh, displayed in guppies. The von Bertalanffy worked with guppies. Uh, this is about two thirds, very small fish. But in fish larvae, look at the upper right corner, uh, left corner, fish larvae are not limited by oxygen at all uh, because they are so small that uh, their body, uh, the, all these cells are, uh, are, have enough oxygen. And the, this is the reason why the growth of fish larvae is exponential. Basically, the, the, this is only a function of weight. And, and it's, it's uh, the weight, a certain percentage of the weight is added uh, every, every time unit. So you add 5% per day or 3% per day or so, something like that. And, and that's an exponential growth, like money at the bank. And you can see that uh, the gill area or the respiratory area uh, grows as fast as the weight itself on the left side. And then when they metamorphose, when they change from larvae into small fish, the ratio, the, the, the slope gets less than one. And that is the time when they begin to grow asymptotically, according to the von Bertalfi equation. So now what is this? The, the catabolism. Catabolism is, is, lots of people have lots of definition, but inside the theory that I present, catabolism is a process that destroys protein, the, destroys the, the body of the, the, the protein of the body without using oxygen. So it's not the burning of the oxygen because the burning of the oxygen, the, the, the burning of, 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 of uh, amino acids is energy metabolism. It's a, uh, you, 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 you combine uh, uh, an organic substrate with oxygen and then you get ATP. That is not that. This is only the loss of the, the, the quaternary structure of, of molecules. Now, this is a, a bit complicated, but basically molecules are chains of amino acids, as you know, and these chains uh, loop around each other and the loops themselves loop around uh, around each other. And so you get uh, first order chains into ordered into secondary structure, into tertiary structure, and the ultimate form of a protein is a quaternary structure. And this structure, the shape that it has is important because it makes the shape makes it work as an enzyme through a lock. Uh, it must have a certain shape to perform a certain job. For example, hemoglobin can function only if it has this shape and uh, it, it can function uh, as uh, for, to transport the oxygen only if it has this very shape. Now, this very shape is very fragile. It's like a, it's like, like a, like a sculpture made out of glass. You shock it a little bit and, uh, and it will break. Now, you still have, like a glass, like, like, like a, a flower made out of glass, if you break it, you still have a glass, but it doesn't work as a glass, right? It, you, it doesn't work as, it does, doesn't do what it is supposed to do. And where do the shocks come from? Well, Brownian movement, do you know the movement of molecules by themselves at a certain temperature? That is enough to break this down. And this is the reason why molecules, organic molecules, 
have a, a half life. They live only a few hours or a few days or a few weeks, but then after they, they get shocked. And, and you know also that temperature, elevated temperature is more shocks. Uh, actually, this is the definition of temperature. Uh, the, the molecules, the kinetic energy of the different molecules in a liquid, for example, increase. And, and, and these structures then break down more easily. And this breakdown, when it occurs, uh, the, it's called denaturation. Uh, the molecules is not usable anymore. And it has, to be, it has to be put into the amino acid pool together with the food. And this is used for making uh, as a fuel for different activities. These activities can be protein synthesis or various activity like breathing, swimming, digesting, and so on. So basically, a fish can, any animal, can either synthesize body substance or have lots of activities, but, but it cannot do both at the same time because it uses a limited amount because it has a limited amount of oxygen which comes from the gills. So almost finished with that. So gill size determines synthesis, determines the level of activity that you can have. And that is the reason why, for example, people in aquaculture spend lots of money bringing oxygen into ponds because they don't need only food, the animals in this pond. They need lots of oxygen. And if they, they don't have oxygen, they don't grow, even if they have food. So these activities are opposite to protein synthesis and to grow. So you can see, for example, if you take a, a given species that is domesticated, in other words, domestication is making is being calm. You you it's like a man who who's get married. You are calm. Um, and uh, uh, the wild type is always the 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 wild uh, form is always looking out because they are afraid they're going to be eaten up by a bird, by a seabird, or they 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 will be uh, uh, some bigger fish around that is going to eat it. So it's always looking around. And it's moving and it's active. A domesticated fish doesn't care. They can let themselves go because they're going to get their food and they are protected. So basically, when we domesticate, we calm the animals so that the oxygen that they have is used only for growth. Uh, in mammals, this is the same effect. But the limiting factor there is not oxygen, it's actually food. But in fish, it's very often oxygen. So, so now we have the elements for explaining things. For example, there is a paradox. Most fish, in most fish, about 80, here it's written 70%, I have recalculated this. In 80% of all species, the overwhelming majority of fish, the female get bigger than the males. Now, now, you probably have heard, and we will talk about it, uh, that the female have more, invest more in reproduction. So if reproductive work is, reproduction work, is causing them to stop growing, is affecting their growth, why are the females bigger? This is not possible, because the female always invest more in reproduction. In fact, this is how you define a female. If, if we went uh, with a spaceship in another planet and they would be being completely different from us, we would identify the male and the female by definition as the one who does more for reproduction is the female. But the, the fish, in fish, they get bigger. And why is it so? They need only, the, the female need only to be a bit more calm than the male who spends most of their time fighting against other males, and they grow. Because about 95% of what the fish eats 
is used for swimming around for activities and only a small part is used really for growth. So if you become a tiny bit more quiet, it, you can double very easily the oxygen available for growth. Now, here is the mythology, right? If you look at A, uh, people think that the, the fish grow fast and then they spawn and that reduces their growth because they grow the, the energy, they say, goes into reproduction. There is all kind of, there is, it's all in all textbooks, it's, it's, it seems to be natural, it seems to be evident that the fish stop growing because they reproduce. But actually, if you re express the growth, not in length, but in weight, you will see that the size at first maturity, WM, is actually before the maximum growth. The maximum growth is growth rate is the, the weight at the inflection of the growth curve. And uh, if you fit a fondant fit growth curve, you can calculate the inflection point. It's at uh, 0.3 of W infinity. And you could see that the, the size at first maturity is before that. So the fish spawn and then they grow faster. Exactly the opposite of what is in the textbooks, in all textbooks. And so something has to give, something is wrong. And what is wrong is A, people, the reason why fish spawn, uh, it's not because they spawn that they stop growing, but it's because they stop growing that they spawn. Hey, you will see in a minute uh, the point. So if you do experiment with fish, you will see that the food conversion efficiency, that is the, 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 the growth divided by the food eaten, uh, drops very fast towards zero. Uh, at W infinity, when a fish has stopped growing, it eats, but it doesn't grow. So the conversion efficiency is zero. And before that, the conversion efficiency is, is, um, is positive. And again, you look in a textbook, why does the food conversion efficiency of fish declines? And there is absolutely no reasonable explanation. This is because I say it is because they don't have oxygen to turn the food that they eat into growth. Uh, and if you plot the amount that they eat, if you, the, if, you, if you model and plot the amount that they eat, you will see that uh, the, the ration, that is the amount of food that they eat daily as a function of body weight, it decreases to a certain level. It decreases. Uh, and at w, at w infinity, at, in other words, at the weight at which they cannot, which they cannot exceed, they, this is uh, sub, uh, 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 the value of the ration doesn't diminish anymore. This is a stable level. Now, the, the theory also explains daily wings. Many of you will know that uh, small fish and small squids and small uh, oysters, when they are young, have daily rings. You can see them electron microscopy on a, with a very good light, mi light microscope. And um, they were discovered in 1971. And the, the, there is no good explanation why why they why they have daily rings and uh, the explanation to me is that uh, <clears throat> all animals have a uh, 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 rhythmicity a uh, daily with rhythmicity that they are active at day and inactive during the night or if they are night active they are active at night and they are inactive during the day what does it mean to be active being active means having muscle that uh, contract and so on, and muscles that use up oxygen. So your pH, you, if your pH, uh, if you use up oxygen, the pH, the, the carbon dioxide uh, in, your, in, your, in your body level increase, and the pH of your, 
of your inside your body decreases. So if you are active, you get lactic acid in your in your legs. And if you are not well trained, for example, if you run uh, uh, after a while, your legs will hurt. This is because of lactic acid. Your 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 muscle become acidic. The, your entire body becomes a little bit acidic, and this acid modifies the structure of uh, the, the, the crystalline structure of the otolith. Now at night, the fish recover and the, the, the crystal structure is, has, is, uh, is deposited with, uh, at, at a higher level of pH. And so the variation in pH, which is shown in A, is, uh, is, um, is leading to a variation in in, uh, in to daily wings. Now, why why do you see that only in young fish and not in big fish? Well, look at this graph. You have seen it before. In A, when you are young, they they can be a big difference between some between night and day because there is space. But when you are old, when you're big, you're close to W infinity. You, essentially, you cannot doing day and night, you, you, you are going to have the same oxygen supply. So basically, you are always out of breath. You're always in pain. You're always uh, in oxygen deficit. And therefore, the rings are not produced anymore. What, what is produced is a mixture of that cannot be read. And uh, this is the explanation why only the young ones have rings and not the old ones. There is no alternative explanation for that. And indeed, when you look at big old fish, they do not contain the otoliths, do not contain organic matter. But if you look at young ones, they contain organic matter. Uh, and more importantly, and this is something that I learned only recently, if you if you take a fish an entire fish, and you put it in a, a mullinex, and you, you get a paste, and you look at the pH of that paste. If it is an old fish, a big, big old one, it will be full of glycolytic enzyme, enzyme that work well in the absence of oxygen. If if it is a young fish, the condition uh, under the same condition, a young fish of the same species. Uh, it will be full of oxidative enzyme, enzyme that work when there's lots of oxygen. Now, this, this uh, paper that is cited here uh, cites lots of other papers. That is reproduced for many, many species. That's not one speculative kind of thing. Uh, this is what happens in fish. In other words, big fish of a certain species uh, have lack oxygen. You can you can tell it in the component in the enzyme component of the body, and you can see what happens to big fish when you stress them. When if you take a tuna or a bonito uh, or whatever you fish and you play with it a long time, uh, after a while they stop fighting, and that's because the body is full of or the pH of the body has gone down, no oxygen in the muscle is available. And the pH is so low that uh, the cell uh, are damaged. And in fact, uh, they, if, you, if you do that too long, the, the flesh is changed. And it's called in the US, for example, they, have, they call this a burnt tuna, and you cannot with a burnt tuna, you cannot make sushi. You, it looks like ah, uh, and uh, so you you can see when you play a fish, and it becomes it, it will fight for a while, and then all of a sudden becomes all limp. It becomes passive. That's because it the oxygen lack of oxygen has actually killed it. And when when if it even if it's not dead, when you put it back in the water. In most cases, they don't recover. Now, now that's kind of 
getting a little bit more difficult. We have, we see that as a fish get bigger, uh, it will get a point that it just has enough oxygen to, to, to survive. So clearly, if it, it has to spawn earlier, because it would be dangerous for it to wait until then, until, until it is so big. So it will spawn at a smaller weight. Let's call it WM1. So this smaller weight corresponds to a higher metabolic rate than the metabolic rate for maintenance, right? It has to be because, because the, the, the gills uh, per area goes down with weight. So there is, let's call it Q infinity and QM. The ratio of these two, at least we don't know. Now we look at B. The, in warmer water, the, I've presented that before, the fish will have to be smaller, right? So the, 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 it will have also to, small at, to spawn at a smaller size. Because if it if it's small if it spawn always at the same size it would have it would have no reserve to produce gonads so, to produce eggs and so on so so QM2 has to be higher than QM1 in A right but what is interesting how about the ratio of QM1 to Q infinity one and QM2 and Q infinity two how about this ratio? Is it that is it the same or different between fish? And it turns out it's exactly the same in all fish. Uh, here you have uh, you have uh, the small one near the near the origin is guppies, and the the one near uh, the the top there are uh, tuna. And you have uh, 50, 50 different species. Uh, they give a ratio of 1.36. This is not L, in, L max or L infinity over L, LM. This is not exactly the same because this is to a certain power, and this power is what, how length is related to metabolic rate. Anyway, so I wrote that in 84. Because if, if the growth of fish is not determined by spawning, I'm saying it's spawning that is determined by growth. I wrote this in 84 and nobody, nobody cared about it. But recently, uh, a few people have been interested and uh, we find the same ratio in, in, uh, in all kinds of fish. Uh, in, uh, for example, in tilapia, in uh, salmon, and in all kinds of fish. I, I find the same ratio even in trilobites, which are extinct since uh, 400 million years. Now, back to, to, um, to the size and temperature. It is well known that when fish uh, <clears throat> are I have a wide range, and uh, they are bigger where the temperature is cold. And that is, uh, you can find it in, in uh, taxonomic books. Also, we also know that uh, for those who studied in Germany, uh, we, we learn about what, what they call Heinke's law. The, the Heinke is a, is a fellow who noticed at the beginning of the 20th century, that place, some flatfish, uh, are bigger in deeper water. Well, we kind of know that, but but why are they why are they bigger? Well, it's colder, it's colder, and and now that you know the relationship between size and temperature, it makes sense for the big fish to be in deeper water, and in fact, if a fish wants to get big then they have to go into deeper water because it's in a, in a shallow water uh, that you can see uh, in Holland and in Germany, uh, 
this is the North Sea. Uh, it's too hot. And you see this pattern also in, uh, in Hawaii here in this case, uh, the fish get, uh, the bigger they get, the deeper they are. And why do they do that? Because the temperature goes down. And if the temperature Daniel, you are muted. Okay, am I am I muted? Not anymore. It's okay. No, it's okay. Thanks. When did it happen? When I began explaining this? Yeah, maybe you muted to your microphone, Daniel. Do you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. Second, uh, it is normal again, no problem. Well, okay. Uh, so this uh, have have this happened during the explanation for this figure? And uh, after it happened when you say the deeper you go, the um, and because of the water it's cold, so okay. you more go deeper, then you grow up better. Okay. Then, then you we can it. continue. We can continue, and. So, come on. I have a little problem with showing the damn thing now. Stop sharing. I I cannot move move my. Could you could you push the uh, slide, please? Push what? Slide. Yeah, on on slide. Yes. Yeah, well, I would like to, but I cannot. It's strange. Uh, I I cannot, and that annoys me because it's now getting uh, getting well, interesting. You can you can... Could you use scroll down, scroll up? No, I Age cannot. It's a no. totally a gift. I, I cannot. Uh, I'm, I'm, I have lost control. Okay, okay let me check it. Deny allow. Record. Allow, allow, allow me. I can. Ah, yes. Allow. Okay. Yes. No. It's okay right now. Yeah. The next, let me see. Okay, okay, I can, okay, I can move it again. Okay. Okay. So, so basically, I have shown you that fish are extremely sensitive to temperature. And now we also know why. And we can see this can be illustrated uh, in the case of West Africa. You have the Sardinella moving from Senegal to the north in Morocco and back out. Pomatopomus saltatrix also does, and also the grouper. Why do they do that? Well, in B, you can see that they try to stay in the same temperature. And because I'm a nice guy, I, I cannot move it again. Give control. OK. So I will. Could you allow me again? Yeah, just a second. I have to get allow. Thank you very much. I don't know. It's OK right now. We'll see. No. So basically what I will do, I will give you control. Uh, let's get back once, get, get back. OK, N one more. So, uh, because I'm a nice guy, I've also shown that for Turkey. I, mm -hmm. y y there was a, a, an old paper, an old Russian paper, that was drawing the, the migration of mackerel. And uh, they were at different places uh, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the year. So, position and month correspond, right? And they spend the winter in the Marmara Sea. And 
basically, wh why are they doing that? If you look at temperature and you go to the right, you kind of see that basically, while the temperature uh, goes from eight degrees to 24 degree, the range of temperature, actually by migrating, the range of temperature that the mackerel exposed to is from about 14 to 24. In other words, the range of temperature is too big for this fish to handle. And by migrating, it reduces the, the, the range of temperature to about 10 degrees, which is something that all fish can handle. So the migration is not in terms of uh, food or, or spawning or whatever. Basically, the fish have to stay within a certain range. And that is uh, an example from uh, Turkey that I, this is my present to you today. Next. So, so this, the fact that fish cannot be at temperatures that are excessive for them is also the reason why they are now moving toward the pole. In the north, they're moving toward the North Pole, in the south, toward the South Pole. And oh, this map is the first map uh, that the IPCC, the Inter Intergovernmental Panel for Climate Change, uh, had about the effect of global warming on marine community on fisheries. Uh, this was produced uh, and uh, by uh, our group, and uh, it shows essentially that in the intertropical belt uh, will lose their fish because they migrate out, whereas the other countries they have a, a changing population. For example, if you take Spain or, or France, France is getting fish from Spain, Spain is getting fish from Morocco, and uh, France is losing fish to Britain. Uh, and the same thing is happening where I live in Canada. Uh, we get fish from the US and we lose fish to Alaska. Uh, there is a transition and uh, you in Turkey, in a, in a, in uh, Aegean, you are getting fish from the Red Sea <laughs> and your cold water fish, they are getting nowhere because they have nowhere to go. So, but climate change is not something that will happen. This is something that has happened since the 70s that the fish actually can notice it since the 70s and 80s. And we, we had a, a paper where we explained, we could show that, we, we, we invented the trick to show that. And this trick is the, the mean temperature of the catch. It's a new thing that we invented. So if you have the fish, uh, of a catch of fish, multi-species catch, or the catch uh, that a boat does, or that a country does, let's say that's the fish of a caught by a country. Some of them will have a temperature that they prefer of eight degrees. Another one will prefer 10 degrees and so on. Fish have preferred temperature. Uh, you can tell because that's the temperature at the center of the distribution, right? And, and so you can compute for this fish given a catch, the mean temperature of the catch, you weight it by the catch. And this mean temperature of the catch, you concept, you can apply it to catch data. For example, the catch data that FAO produces. And we can see in the upper picture, we can see that in subtropical and temperate climate, such as in Turkey or in France or in Canada, the, the mean temperature of the catch and temperature itself, SST, the sea surface temperature, is more or less parallel. They both increase because there is a change in fauna. We're getting fish from warmer climate and the fish from the, that like cold water, they go away. Now, what happens in the tropics? In the tropics, temperature is also increasing, but the, marine, the mean, tropic, uh, mean temperature of the catch is not increasing. At first it may, but, uh, but then it has to stabilize because in the tropics, the fish that, that leave are not replaced by other fish from the hypertropic 
uh, because they don't exist. And so they, they have the same fish. And so basically you end up with a situation where <clears throat> in the subtropical on the left side, in the subtropic and temperate ocean, you have you had before uh, cold fish that like cold water, blue ones, and fish that like warm water, reddish one. In in the in the turn of the century, you have fish, you have less fish that have cold water affinities and more warm water affinities. In the future, all the fish in the in these areas will have warm water affinities. Well, how about the tropics? Well, the tropics starts with fish with warm water affinities. So nothing can change. And uh, so at the end, they also have fish uh, with warm water affinities, but they have less of them because the other ones are le have left. So that is uh, the way it looks, and that is not pretty. And that that uh, is the end. I would say thank you very much. and. Uh, those of you that will write me as, at this address can get papers, uh, PDF, of everything that I have spoken about. And uh, I, I will also send you this, uh, this PowerPoint if you want, and papers that uh, were, are mentioned. I will send them to anybody who send me an email. Thank you very much. So I stop Thank sharing. Thank you so much, Daniel. You're welcome. Now I will stop sharing. I, yes. We and I have questions, but before I would like to stop express presenting. my thank you. Thanks to I will stop I presenting. Didn't... No problem. You can keep it or uh, take it. Can okay. you stop it, please? Or Daniel, stop you sharing. Well, uh, get me out of there. I I, I cannot uh, get get myself out of it. Shabbos Shalom. Onun fotoğrafını. Hello. Okay, I I am here. Well, I I would like to to see something. I I would like okay. to see. Okay, stop okay. presenting. Um. Uh, where's my mouse? Uh, okay, could you allow me? Yeah, uh, I will allow you, except that I don't see my mouse. Oh, or... oh okay, yes, stop presenting. Okay, yes. there we are. All right. All so, right. Thank you, so, thank you much. so much. Daniel, we know very well there is huge time differences between Canada and Turkey. It should be around 11 p.m. Almost uh, midnight. It's, it's, it's okay. I'm, I'm, I don't. I don't have my mom anymore to tell me I have to go to bed. It's okay. <laughs> Thank you. So I would like to express my sincere thanks to you and also your former student Eileen Ulman. She's uh, in a YouTube channel and she followed, of course, your speech. Uh, this organization wouldn't have been possible if she couldn't help us. Thanks, uh, both of you. Uh, we had a chance to be together in Barcelona around, I think, 2004 in Cream Project about the ecosystem approach to fisheries uh, network and you know, a scientific research network on ecosystem approach to fisheries. So we wanted to see you physically, not virtually, in Turkey. This is beginning. Uh, let's say we should, I mean, we. I hope we may have a possibility to see you and host you here in Turkey and uh, to share your great experience with our colleagues and students uh, face to face. Now we have several questions. Uh, one of them uh, from our uh, okay. Let me hear. Has Marmecha uh, Miss? I think her question is: Is it the colder water the reason behind the size of Atlantic tuna from the rest of its family? 
as far as I understood. But, uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, you, you got the uh, I understand the question. But uh, Atlantic tuna, uh, bluefin tuna, the, 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 the big bluefin tuna, uh, is actually not different, not very different from the Pacific, uh, from the southern bluefin and from the, the, the Pacific bluefin. Uh, they, they, are, they are not very different. And in fact, before, uh, if you look at literature in the 50s, they were considered to be the same species. So you don't need you don't need to look for a reason for the difference because the differences are very small, and uh, they the difference are very much in the eyes of the beholder. Uh, uh, because if you are a lumper, you know that taxonomists they are taxonomists that put things together and, and taxonomists that like to separate things, and uh, a lumper taxonomist would say it's the same species. They are not very different. So I don't need to find an explanation for a difference because there actually is not much of a difference. Okay, thank you. And a good friend of mine from Barcelona, Oscar Segipla, has a question. He's a free diver, he's an expert on rotational fisheries and the intersection, the topics intersection. Uh, between the small scale fisheries and rotational fisheries. He's asking why most coastal species like grouper, uh, Epineterus marginatus, for instance, or Dantex dantex, to prefer to stay above thermoclean in summer if they have less oxygen. If, I don't know whether. Well, uh, as long in, as yeah, long as. This, I, I, again, the the fish have a, a temperature preference, and that temperature preference is where the enzyme works better. I, the the function of protein and enzyme and so on depends on temperature, and a, a, a certain species will have a certain set of enzyme which make it efficient at a given temperature. At lower temperature, the enzyme are less efficient, at higher temperature, less efficient, and with beyond five degree on each side, uh, it's death. Now, <clears throat> obviously, when the fish gets uh, into colder water, it has an advantage that it has no, it, it, uh, that it, uh, it uh, requires less oxygen, but uh, it, other things go sl more slowly also, and they, it takes longer for them to grow, right? To grow big, and uh, when you are small, you 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 are eaten a lot. So basically, the fish will want to to be in warm water when they are small because they have to grow out of being small. It's only when they are big that uh, that they like to be in cold water. All right. So. So basically, um, basically the fish always alternate between between uh, the advantage of being in the warm water, which is lots of food, lots of things, and the advantage of being in cold water. <clears throat> and okay. different species will have different optima. All right, Daniel. Miss Fielder has a question. Uh, she wants to ask. Fishing warming and oxygen reduction uh, form. When was the highest time? This is the question. Affected the global fisheries catch, especially tropical countries. Can you? Could you understand the question? I mean, what? I think what was the highest time? Okay. She said, but I think should be temperature. I think. Affected the global fisheries catch, especially tropical countries. Uh, and I'm not sure I understand, but basically. Uh, the question is not, yes. I think she's asking the highest uh, time or temperature that could be affected uh, global fisheries catch, especially in tropical countries. It, it is already affected, but the highest it time. Has, it has. It has already begun 
to be too hot sure. for many fish. And, and uh, they are already stocks that are declining. I so so sorry, so sorry. That it is too warm for them. Uh, it is, uh, you have this in Mediterranean Turkey. You have in, in the southern Mediterranean and the southeastern Mediterranean, it's too hot for Mediterranean species and they are being replaced by Red Sea species. So it, the change and future has already begun. Uh, and in, in the eastern Mediterranean, very much. Uh, I think that's the question. Uh, if, on the other hand, fisheries have peaked in the tropics later, because industrial fishing has been introduced later in uh, in the tropics, uh, in uh, the North Atlantic, uh, the maximum catch was reached in seventy-five. Uh, okay, Karim Arzini is uh, online, as far as uh, I see. If he has any question. It would be a pleasure to have his question. He was one of your co-authors, I think, in the reconstruction of fisheries data in Portugal. Karim, can you hear us? Uh, by the way, I have a question, uh, oh. not directly related to your presentation. Uh, existing presentation, but having this opportunity uh, to ask you, there was a debate between you, your team, uh, was preparing uh, reconstruction of fisheries data and FAO, INEE. And the, I remember two papers published in Marine Policy, next to next, uh, and it was very interesting. Uh, at the beginning, they didn't want to accept the criticizing and the, the results you put at the end as far as I could follow very well well they said they, they you reached consensus agreed on uh, the importance of reconstruction of issues data what was the case actually uh, can you explain us uh, about the uh, what, what basically basically FAO does a lot of work and lots of good work putting together the, date, the statistics for the world. It does good work. And uh, the countries, some countries, do bad work, sending them bad data. Okay? Now, FAO does what it can with limited budget, limited personnel, and they do the best they can. They have constraints. They cannot say certain things. They, they cannot criticize the countries when they don't send the data and so on. They do the best they can. And now <clears throat> it, is, it is difficult psychologically to accept that some people and some university um, can take the data and add to them uh, insights, quality, additional data and and it looks like, like, like we don't deserve the credit for all the work. But uh, we, we always acknowledge that our data is the FAO data plus, and the plus is our work. We add the discard, which they should add, but they don't. We add the recreational catch, which they don't have data for, but we have found them. They add, they cannot add illegal catch because nobody wants to admit that they have illegal catch, but it can be estimated by us. And so they had to accept that we do what they cannot do. And it is psychologically a bit difficult. And until there are some people that to the end have fought against, against uh, <clears throat> our work. And some people at FAO liked our work, uh, and so I have some friends working at FAO, 
<clears throat> but Luca Garibaldi, who was the head of statistics, hated us, it hated our work. I, it started, <laughs> it, and in fact, he was the reviewer of the last paper in which we said, we agree with FAO and FAO does good work. Because as reviewer, and he signed the review, it, no, I know it's him. He said, we don't, we have not become better. We were always good. So you cannot, you cannot pay us a compliment. So he, now FAO has sent him out uh, in the field. He's not in Rome and he is retired. And uh, I think that uh, this is one reason where things have become a bit less tense. Thank you. Thank you so much. It was very interesting uh, for us. Now we, we are more familiar to what happened actually between the Sierra Pass project and the FAO. Anna uh, Mandao has uh, Adamo. Adamo, sorry, has a question. Uh, she can uh, yeah. ask or something, Thank yeah, please. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for the presentation. It was really, really interesting. Um, I have a question about uh, the potential effect that this theory could have uh, actually now, current or in the next the future, on the fisheries quota because uh, and the uh, stock assessment and all related because we already know that fisheries is also a matter of geopolitical issue and we cannot see all our um, uh, fisheries uh, go to the north or to the cooler, uh, cooler yeah, yeah. water, of, obviously. But uh, this, uh, I have the impression that this theory could actually affect a lot on the uh, current quota on the next, uh, um, in the next future about the fisheries quota. Could yeah. you give us your yeah. impression? Uh, Thanks. Yeah, uh, this is uh, this very good point. And there, there are two aspects to it that I can comment briefly. One of them is that one ton of small fish and small ton, one ton of big fish is, cannot be compared because big fish are very, produce lots of eggs and are very, is a stable community. Small fish produce few eggs and is very unstable. So if fish get smaller and stressed by oxygen, the variability of the stocks uh, is going to be is going to be uh, reduced, is going to increase, and the productivity in terms of yield that can be sustained is going to be less. That's one aspect of warming. Uh, a given species, if it is reduced, if the fish are reduced in size, is going to be less productive. The second point: they are moving places. It creates tensions everywhere. And the first good case of that, we had, uh, there was uh, the stock of mackerel between Norway, the Faroe Island, and Iceland. There are three countries that, between them, there is a, a place uh, in international waters, and they, they made a treaty that was five years to negotiate, the, a treaty to divide among themselves the stock of mackerel that was there. And while the, the treaty was then after five years there, they had agreed on you get that much, I get that much, and he, she get that much. But the mackerel in the meantime had moved into the exclusive economic zone of Iceland. And <laughs> the, the Icelanders say, we are not sharing it with anybody. That's gonna be our fish. So that, that is a problem. And I remember one time I was telling uh, um, the, a bunch of journalists in Senegal, in Dakar, I was telling them, you know, your fish are moving to, toward uh, Mauritania. And a young woman said, let's catch them before they get there. Let's, let's catch them all before they get there. And that is exactly the problem that happens now. Uh, uh, the, the fishery, the state fishery in the U.S., they have a uh, state's fishery, right? And in South Carolina, they have this, the fish moving to North Carolina, and they move to uh, uh, New Jersey and to New York and so on along the coast. And, and that is uh, 
the management plan that were uh, established uh, are not valid anymore because the fish are somewhere else. And, and the management regime that we have are inadequate. And the time that we need to negotiate new management regime is also too long. And so it, the, we will have to invent new ways of allocation, of allocating fisheries resource, because if we do it as slowly as, slowly as we do now, uh, as then uh, events are faster than, uh, than our uh, uh, management, uh, the management plan. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Daniel. Uh, our youngest participant, I think, uh, she's from our faculty. She's a student, has a question. Jemre, can you ask her question? Hello, my name is Jemre. I am the last class of the Faculty of Fisheries. Uh, first, uh, it's my honor to meet you in this meeting. Uh, I would like to ask a question. How does this temperature rise affect the Mediterranean Sea? Uh, when is the critical time, especially Mediterranean Sea? Okay. Thank you in advance. Yeah. So basically, I I guess in Turkey, you you are most one of the country that is most affected by this kind of changes because what you have is you have a chunk of the Red Sea. It's it's now not one fish or two fish. It's the entire Red Sea that is coming into the Med, right? Uh, and uh, I have now written uh, with uh, Eileen a paper about Logocephalus celeratus, uh, about this uh, nasty fish that will kill you, uh, because it, it is now in Turkey as comfortable as it was in the Red Sea. So, you you asking when will this ha happen that the transition it it's now it's it's happening now do not expect any massive change to happen like a volcanic eruption in one go or like, like in movies in movies things happen in 3 days or in one day the 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 the, the change in our world and the effect of global warming are like erosion. They are constant and they are little by little by little. So one species and then one species and then one species. And, and uh, you can see the change when you compare the memories that people have, old people compared with young people. There you can see the change. And uh, for example, Eileen, her father was a diver in Turkey, and uh, uh, he was fishing for uh, sponges and so on. And if you compare generation, there you get massive change. But if you do, if, if, within your lifetime, the change will be always little by little by little. And that's the reason why most people think the change is not big, because it's always little by little by little. And then because of shifting baseline, we forget the change that has happened before. So we think if you if you are lucky, you're gonna get you're gonna become an old woman, right? It's always better than the alternative, not to become an old woman. So let's say you, you become an old yeah. You, if you become an old woman, and <laughs> you will you will the 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 Red Sea and the Mediterranean will not be different it will be the same thing and you will <clears throat> that will be your world you, and you will not know the <coughs> you will not have known the mediterranean without reception's migrant you you will not know know it and that will be a the world before will be lost to you like we listen to to History, like the picture behind your head. Uh, 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 well, you, the picture they uh, sold you in, probably in Gallipoli, uh, right? They, this is the past. This is history. But but it was real and it was happening when when these people were young. 
And, and so don't expect massive change in one go. It will, I hope it will never happen. What will happen is a slow, slow erosion, so slow decline of everything. And that's also the reason why we accept this change. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, regarding the Lagocephalus scleritus, Daniel, I was one of the authors who introduced scientific community uh, in the world for the entrance of Lagocephalus scleritus uh, to the Mediterranean. We published yeah. in the Journal of Fish Biology, all the authors, yes. other colleagues also are following this uh, webinar. It was 2003, after five years, one specimen created huge problem. Nowadays, one the, of the biggest place. problem for small scale fisheries and yeah, fishers, yeah. southern and the uh, southwest of Turkey, Mediterranean coast of Turkey is Lagocephalus scleritus. And the one other newcomer is uh, lionfish, as you know. So the problem, the most important problem, in my opinion, we are not able to monitor what is going on within the sea. Okay, this species came to our sea. We know at least impact of this species on fishers because it damages fishing gears and they yeah. eat fishes and tangle it to their nets, created huge economic loss for them. But what is going on in the ecosystem and the web, food web and within the sea? Yeah. Uh, we have a, prob a question from Eileen. Karim Erzim, Okay, let me give the floor to Karim Erzini first. He is with us and then I will give the floor to Eileen. Karim? Uh, yes, thank you very much. Thank you for a very interesting talk. Uh, I have a question on uh, not on fish but on birds because I'm reading a very interesting book at the moment on migratory birds. It's called The World on the Wing and there's an enormous amount of data on uh, birds that mig migrate long distances mm -hmm. and apparently there's a, a general trend of a decrease in size. The birds are getting uh, smaller and uh, before they migrate they undergo these remarkable physiological uh, changes they 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 bulk up uh, some of their internal organs atrophy um, i'm just wondering if you have any thoughts on that if there's any uh, link to oxygen or with the increasing in temperature or if there's anything to do with that uh, i think so but <clears throat> The, it's it's tricky. Birds birds have emerged from dinosaurs, and dinosaurs emerged at the end of the Permian uh, at at a time when oxygen was very low, and they they were an, a fantastic invention um, because they they as opposed to mammals they have these hollow bones and uh, they they have these super efficient lungs that uh, that um, <clears throat> that that uh, where the air doesn't stagnate but always move and uh, birds birds are extremely efficient uh, in terms of the oxygen intake they have and but they are also subject to physical constraint much more than than mammals because 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 they fly and um, and so one species of bird varies very little the 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 physical features of them varies very little because because they are much more constrained by the physics of flying and and uh, the the, the chemistry of of uh, high performance, and so <clears throat> I cannot imagine that a change in temperature would not affect them, because it, it, it uh, even a change in in the properties of the air, the the change of wind and the change in, even the density of air is going to affect them. Uh, another one is seabirds. At least for seabirds, I know that. They are 
starved for fatty fish. They are, they are moving down the food web because they have to eat zooplankton instead of little fish, little fatty fish. And uh, in California, it's been well studied where they eat krill, the birds, instead of uh, the seabirds, instead of uh, anchovies. Much less fat. Uh, in fact, uh, Cushiseans barely use fat. They use more, more glucose for storage, uh, but not fat. And, uh, and uh, so the, the, the eggs don't, uh, are not so rich. The, the, the clutch size is uh, smaller and so on. So fish are affect, oh, sorry, birds are affected both uh, nutritionally, but also probably by the physics, the change in, in the physics of maybe flying. But uh, that's all I will, will say, because birds, birds are, are magnificent in regard to their use of oxygen. When they fly, for example, the one that migrate across the Himalaya, they don't fly when they get above the Himalaya. They are not just a few meters above the Himalaya. They are hundreds of meters above the Himalaya. They kind of make a point of making a somersault almost just to show what they can. Yeah. Thank you, Karim and Daniel. Uh, Karim, it was so nice to hear from you after a long time. We want to see you again in Turkey. Uh, here is the question of Eileen. Uh, she is following us uh, through the YouTube channel, so I will read her question. Can you please share your advice to everyone that writing opinion pieces matter to be able to reach the general public? Your C is pricey critic was the best opinion piece written this year. You know the documentary in Netflix? I read your actually opinion about this. I also agree with Eileen. What do you think about this? Well, I was I was shocked and I, I, I was shocked because industrial fisheries are a real, real, real problem. And uh, they have, they are horrible actually. They destroy the environment, especially trawlers. They reduce biodiversity. They uh, they treat the the crew the 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 on board uh, like slaves. They they practice slavery on board. They do all kind. Of, they smuggle. They fish illegally, and they do all kind of horrible things. So you have a big problem there, and then you have a problem. It's like a tank, a big problem like a tank. And then there is a there is a thing that you are supposed to 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 use against the tank, and that's a fly swatter. You know what? The the thing that you have, the little thing that you use to get at the flies, you have a fly swatter. Uh, you should not eat fish to fight against the monster. And that's so crazy. If think about smoking. If, it is, if you, it is. If, when everybody was smoking, when everybody was smoking, uh, and and smoke was everywhere, and it made everybody sick, was the solution that Daniel Pauli stopped smoking? I never smoked, by the way, but it was not the solution, uh, or that or that you stop smoking. No, it's the solution is that the government forbids smoking, right? And so the activity, uh, the of the activist, has to be directed at the government to force everybody to smoke in closed rooms. And so if you have a problem that fishery is, is fishing illegally, is discarding fish, is employing slaves on boats, the solution is not, not to eat fish, but to forbid these activities. So you have a monster problem and a ridiculous solution. And not only you have a ridiculous solution, but you have to criticize the people who are in real in the real world fighting for real solution. So in the process of saying the only thing that you can do is that is good thing that you can do is not eat fish, in the process of doing that, they have to criticize everybody. 
who is involved in fighting the big uh, against the fishing sector. So, for example, the, the for example the the dolphin free tuna people, the, the the old man with the white hair, he was he was saying, I cannot guarantee that no dolphin is killed in this fishing operation, and that was used to make his his NGO a bad killers of dolphin. But the context is that in in tuna fisheries, they were killing the American tuna fish fleet, for example, was killing hundred thousand of dolphin every year, hundreds thousand. And and they have reduced that to perhaps a few. And this is honest. The man was honest in saying we cannot guarantee that none get killed. But we I'm sure he said we have reduced it from 100,000 to perhaps 10, but they have not said that, the 10 to 100,000. They just mentioned that uh, a few are killed. And, and, and this, this is dishonest. And besides, the, the film uh, had fake scenes, you know, like all the, the police is after us. I can make a movie like that. I come to Istanbul. And I, right? I, in the night, and I, 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 I make a picture of the police is after me. No police will yeah. after them. It's nonsense. Yeah, it depends on where you are this looking is... uh, from. Yes, the perspective. Actually, they're not aware about the people uh, from Southeast Asia, Philippines, Taiwan, and the Thailand, India. It's always the, bad people. Uh, yeah, fishing dependency is too high in those nations. You know, they have to it's eat true. fish. They have to eat yep. fish. This is a simply bad advertisement of vegan people. This is what I think, actually. Thank you, Eileen, for your nice question. We had a chance to listen and learn the opinion of uh, Pauli. Now, uh, our PhD student, Jensen, has a question. He is working also uh, tuna fishing vessels as an observer. I hope he Oof. has a question related to tuna fish. Let's see. Hi, Mr. Pauli. Uh, I'm working as a fisheries observer on both Atlantic and uh, Indian Ocean since 2015. And my question is actually, I also read your article about uh, in 2010 about is uh, failing the high seas, the oh, uh, global yes. of regional fisheries management organizations. Probably you remember that. Uh, yes, my question is, the do you think the tuna stocks are sustainable or it's actually when I work on the high seas I'm actually asking myself I'm really protecting the tuna fishery stock or is, is it we, working yeah. RFM mode? So basically the tuna fishery fisheries are, ex, are experiencing the same thing that all fisheries are. The most fragile tuna, the Atlantic bluefin, down the tube. The, the, the Pacific one and uh, the southern bluefin tuna are reduced to a very small fraction of what they were before. Then yellowfin in uh, the other ones, albacore, yellowfin, and so on, in the, in the Atlantic and in the Indian Ocean, whoops, down. Where is the big, the, the catch in the Atlantic is declining, then the catch in the Indian Ocean is declining. Now the the hello uh, the and now the majority of the catch is coming from the Pacific, and it will also go down because because they always operate at the edge. They never allow a reserve a, 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 a security. This is always at the edge. So if you make a mistake, Doc, you are over the hump. And the sustainability is not the point. Because when you have reduced a stock to 10% of what it was, or 5% of what it was, like, like the roofing, sustainability means that you would sustain, you would maintain very little for a long time. What we should aim for is rebuilding. 
is rebuilding the abundance that we had before. Because sustain, sustaining overfish stock in a sustain in a in a in a, in, a, in a overfished in a depleted status is really a bad idea. And what is what should be done is trying to rebuild the stocks. And stock rebuilding is done very rarely. And there's only one country that does it systematically, and that's the US. They do lots of things badly in the US, but uh, the rebuilding of stocks is done well. As soon as a stock is declared or is overfished, they have to produce a management plan. The quota has to be reduced such that it is rebuilt to the level that produce maximum sustainable yield within 10 years. And no politician intervenes, no no, no ministry uh, that says, oh, we have to save this village or whatever. It's rebuilding. And the, the Americans have rebuilt, are rebuilding their stocks and thus the profitability of the fisheries and the, the abundance of the ecosystem everywhere uh, they can. And, and, and the, this is not done in other countries in the same way. And 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 uh, Canada is as bad as Western Europe, and we don't talk about Turkey because that <laughs> the issue in Turkey is not sustainability; it's rebuilding, right? I mean, yeah. I mean, the the situation is so bad. What what you don't want to sustain what you have now? You want to rebuild and and getting your government and your entrepreneurs and stuff to agree on a rebuilding is something else, right? We should rebuild uh, first, I think, before stocks, we should rebuild the management process, governance in Turkey, I think. Because I'm engaged well, the management, with the ecosystem. Without, without having a good management process, you cannot have a rebuilding, clear. Yes, so yes, 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 you're right. Okay, I just wonder your advice uh, from outside of the Turkey uh, for the management of uh, anchovy in Black Sea. Turkey is a big player in Black Sea. We, we explore 80% of the anchovies, I think, as far as I know, and we have a big fleet in Black Sea. Anchovy is very important for us, like dolphin fishing, Maltese people, and tuna for Mediterranean, Japan, but anchovy uh, stocks can face a problem that Peruvian anchovy faced in 1970s, for instance. What would be your uh, suggestion to authority management authority or science? I think I think I think we should we should have a, uh, we should not have fisheries for fish meal anymore. I think that uh, fish should be used for direct human consumption. And uh, uh, if if you cannot find in Turkey a market for, for little fish, you will find a market in Africa. Uh, the, for example, Nigeria imports huge quantities of small fish from Norway. And uh, there are markets here. Uh, we have a crazy fishery that fish uh, um, herring, or sardine like uh, only for the for the for the gonads and the fish the rest the the body is thrown away or is used for fish meal and it is completely crazy because this is the fish are better and they are more healthy and they're tastier than this big uh, stupid uh, Norwegian salmon but that that they are, they are fed to but the transformation of of our fishery for for fish meal into into fishery for humans that is part of the things that we must fight for and it is difficult because people think oh why why should i why should i do that but they they could even make more money i mean i mean they would if they could sell anchovies as for for human food they could get more money than they do now they just have to be inventive I have I've been talking to 
to to Peruvian entrepreneurs about that. And uh, I, I was saying, why don't you catch this anchovy, dry them, they have lots of sun, dry them and sell them to Africa. You're going to get more money. But they don't, they don't even know. And, and they looked at me like I was a Martian. You know, I, like, like, like I was like I was green with antennas. They, they never thought about it. They, they just they just have the fish, they grind it up, and and they make fish meal. They have done it for 50 years. Why should they not continue forever? Yeah. I think this is the biggest challenge to change behavior uh, and habits of uh, farmers, fishers, uh, who are strictly depend on their, uh, let's say, their That's what, culture. That's what we have government to, to push in a certain, look now the 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 Biden administration is it it's pushing toward electric cars right what it, yes. it wants to change the economy sure. governments are good governments do this they don't continue to do something that that goes into a hole you, they, they they push you away from from the hole into something that works. And, and that's what government should do. Okay, what else? So, Daniel, thank you very much. Uh, two last questions. I will keep the uh, Eileen's one uh, as last question. Uh, before that, uh, that uh, one of our colleagues from our department is asking whether there's a possibility to follow your lectures or some of your lectures uh, for our master or PhD students, is there any possibility to like this? Is at uh, some mm -hmm. uh, universities are providing free of charge lectures to all over the world students? Uh, what do you think about this? I, I they want to. That. They want to follow your lectures. I, I, I told you. I told you you can have the PowerPoint. You can have no, papers. No, no, I'm not talking about the this PowerPoint. Uh, for instance, I'm sure you are delivering lectures at the Fisheries Center in the UB. Oh, uh, uh, doing, some, a mock, uh, doing a mock, doing a mock, massive online. What is it? On, yeah, shouldn't be online, but if if there's a store that your lectures are there, maybe they can. Uh, get benefit from your former lectures. If there's well, a possibility, they can join to your remote teaching uh, lectures. Oh, I see. I don't uh, know, actually. I, that, I see what you mean. You mean uh, I, that uh, lecture that I give a uh, public? The, uh, sure. The university. I, but well, well, you know, in the United States, Canada, most of the universities uh, are not free of charge. If you want to follow one lecture, you should get credit. You should pay for that. You should oh, pay for that. Awesome. But some uh, countries, uh, for instance, some universities from Stanford, Cambridge, uh, sometimes they provide free lecture to everyone, whoever interested in so free class. Basically, I hear you. And uh, I, you should send me a formal kind of request, and I will okay. push it. Okay. I will push it with my director because that is uh, that goes beyond me. Uh, yes, this is, yes, yes, sure. Uh, okay. You, but basically, I, I I do believe in freeing data. The I I do believe in like fish base and the sea rounders and stuff. Is all providing data for nothing for free, you, and uh, lectures I have no problem also with them being free. But the it, it depends on the context. Other people maybe not. So the, write me a request, and I will discuss yes, it with yes. our director. Thank you. Thank you. Do you still accept students at uh, the PhD level, master level? Uh, what are the criteria? I mean, if some of the brilliant genius uh, students from Turkey want or they want to 
join your team or to do master or PhD under uh, well, your supervision? I, I still, what I, do you think? What do you say? I still take master student uh, if they are funded. Um, that funding is the big problem now, uh, yes. but not PhD student because I'm already 75, and uh, uh, you, you know you it's, are not looking it's, uh, five to years. But oh, okay. uh, yeah, so master student is two two years or so. So I take master student. I, I will have, for example, in September two new master student. It's fine, but PhD student I don't take anymore. Man. I have one more, and she will finish in one two years, and that. I will have the only master's student until until my health goes down. Okay. So thank you so much for all. Actually, whoever had an opportunity to work with you, I, whom I know, said he's not only a great scientist, he's a very humble, very... Uh, he, he was like a father for us. Uh, some thank of you. them was Yaji, uh, Chinese... Uh, Oh, you scientist know her. who is who is working in uh, in, in Norway. We are trying yes. to publish a paper uh, with her nowadays. She was co-supervisor of our Spanish uh, Spanish student from Alicante University. <laughs> I, as far as I know, you are teaching at the Sustainable Fisheries Management Master Program in Alicante University. Our uh, common friend Jose Luis Sanchez Lisaso also knows you very well. She, he knows you. So it's a, not a very big world, a small world, everyone engaged with each other uh, somehow. Uh, I appreciate your, you are very humble. Thank you so much for giving us this opportunity. So the last question from Eileen, what is going on uh, between Ray Hilburn and uh, Daniel Pauli? Are you happy at, the, uh, at last with their appreciation? Because there, like FAO and your project, the reconstruction of fisheries data, we are familiar to conflict between Ray Hilburn and Daniel Park. Oh, to I, I, I don't this. talk about what, that. What happened? All right. I, okay. I, I don't was, cite him. I don't cite him, and I, I let him and I, I let him boil in his own juice, and and I, I don't really? bother with him. Oh, <laughs> all right. Daniel, thanks a lot. Thanks a million. You're welcome. Bye. Good night. Here in Turkey. Ciao. Ciao. Ciao.